Hello everyone and welcome to the Financial Fox. On today's show, we are going to discuss investing in gold equity market and opportunities with Kevin Watsworth and Patrick Karim, co-founders of NorthStartBadCharts.com. We had them on the show already. And joining us is also Mark Child, the CEO of London listed company Condor Gold. We had already a conversation about analyzing uh, uh, the gold price, reading the chart and see what the chart is telling us and what investors should consider if they want to invest in gold or they want to diversify. But what I wanted to do today is really to uh, look more uh, into the equity market and uh, what are the opportunities for investors to uh, invest in gold at this point in time when the gold price is still struggling and maybe we expect it to behave in a different way well there's a lot, lot going on at the moment Stefania as you're probably aware and um, we're in a process myself and Patrick analyzing the technical charts not just for gold and silver but for the markets in general and um, of course we've got a lot of issues with uh, energy uh, costs we've got a lot of issues uh, going on with well particularly and I, I should really state this at the beginning the stock markets are in a very precarious situation at the moment, the S&P and NASDAQ have both broken down versus inflation and just completed a very bearish looking back test, particularly in the case of the NASDAQ. So uh, regardless whether S&P or NASDAQ managed to claw back some nominal gains versus inflation, they are in a bear trend now. Um, and when this happens, and this is the fourth time this has happened uh, since the First World War, uh, when you get these signals, uh, being confirmed on monthly closing basis, then it suggests um, you see a rotation of uh, funds away from general equities and towards uh, what you could just term real stuff, um, commodities, if you like, energy in particular at the moment, but uh, uh, base metals, commodities, uh, uranium, um, precious metals. Um, precious metals tend to get dragged down at the start of this process, and that's what's happening at the moment. We're seeing a capitulation well I, my personal view is that we'd like to see a capitulation uh, low in the next um probably a couple of weeks actually it could be quite quick uh, during the month of september and we could see some crazy um sort of wicks on the monthly candle being put in place a little bit like march 2020 uh, but the evidence is very strongly suggesting that the um the trend reversal in favor of precious metals and away from um, general equities is uh, starting to get underway now. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, so it's basically a good time for people, for investors to start uh, um, looking to, to take a position in gold. And uh, some, uh, some investors will say that perhaps equity is much better play because then, you know, you can... Uh, you can you have an effect from the gold price, but also you can take the upside of uh, uh, a company that is well positioned to execute on their strategy. And that's where I wanted to bring in Mark Child, that is the CEO of a London listed company, Condor Gold, and he has been working very hard to uh, bring the company to the stage that is right now. And perhaps it would be good to hear, Mark, from your side, why you think that uh, investing in uh, a company could deliver better returns for investors? Well, the gold producers have had a, a very difficult time. Um, I think we just need to set the scene. Since June, yeah. the the average gold producer is, uh, the gold major gold producers index is down about 40% as we speak, and the explorers and uh, index is down 40, 45%. Uh, so the, those are both American indices. So that's difficult. Against that backdrop, gold, of course, is off about $350 from its high, and it's nudging on $1,700 today. So uh, equity uh, holders have been have dragged down because of a number of issues right now. Um, but that, we can argue, is pretty much pretty much priced in. When you, when you see these 40% falls in equity prices, I, it, to me, it looks like in a very, relatively short time, that, that's... Uh, a look to buy rather than a look to sell, I would suggest. And some of the things that have driven that down as well have been the, in, the inflation coming into the sector, where within the average 
uh, gold producers uh, and mining companies is quite a high proportion of their operating costs are actually energy costs. Um, they, they tend to be quite heavy on energy and megawatts for running processing plants and for the mining fleet using diesel. So if both of those go and double, there's a, there's a sort of hit on margins at a similar time when gold prices come down, you, 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 you've you had that. But that, that I would say, is, is reflected um, in the share price. Having said that, the gold industry on average is producing at an all-in sustaining cash cost of around about $1,000 an ounce, uh, $1,100 an ounce. So even at 1700 where we've had this set-off, it's uh, an awful lot better than it was three years ago where gold was 12 Twelve fifty an ounce. Um, so we should just we should put that in the context for the pension fund. So there's and, and I think you'll continue to see dividends being paid out by the major producers. Uh, they're in very good financial uh, condition. They've repaid most of their debt. They're not leveraged. They haven't got on big buying sprees at all. They've learned from a previous cycle. So it, it is a more leveraged way into gold um, through 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 the producers. Maybe, Kevin and Patrick, analyzing the chart of uh, gold producer, what do you see being the trend? What do you see we should expect? This is like the, as chart traders, we always try to seek uh, like a weight of evidence to, to see all the macro, I call it the chart defined macroeconomics. So instead of just like, let's say, saying we're in an inflationary period and then trying to match out to the charts, we actually look at 100 year charts and then from the charts, we're able to see breakdowns, capital flow turns. And there's one thing that I've noticed, and a lot of people say, ah, oh, I don't understand, Patrick. My gold miner is, is not tracking gold price. Gold price is at all-time highs, but why? how come my miner is in at all-time high? And then there's the fundamentals, like Mark explained, that, okay, well, there's a higher energy cost, whatever, it, it goes on the margin. But from a chart perspective, gold miners silver the metal, silver miners, uranium miners, all, all this asset class, what they're actually tracking is the capital flows uh, as defined by the gold to SPX ratio. So I could practically take any gold miner chart, put it on a, on a chart screen, and then I overlay the gold divided by SPX and it will match the price action of that. So the more gold is able to outperform SPX so SPX could be going up, gold could be going up to all time highs, but if SPX is still going up, that ratio will look, it, it could be going down depending which one's outperforming which. When gold breaks out versus SPX and it's starting to grind recently, I've been tracking it since over a week, gold, even if the gold price has been going down, it's been performing better than the SPX and eventually the miners will reflect that. So the capital flows are gonna be leaving. So let's say the capital flows are the money supply, circul uh, currency in circulation as those, instead of going into growth stocks, tech stocks and all that, they'll start going into gold and the miners, silver metal will be reacting to that. So it's very close until gold breaks out versus SPX, then the miners will have headwinds. But once that happens, the, the flip, the script's gonna be flipped and the miners are gonna be going, they're gonna be going nuts, but that still has to happen. And we're in the process now of that happening. I did a, a chart, showing showcasing in 2000 when the u.s equity started breaking down it dragged like as kevin said it dragged gold down but what people didn't see was on the way down while gold and spx was going down the gold to spx ratio was actually going up so gold was performing better even on the way down and after that after two three months after the yes equities break down the the script is flipped and then after that gold goes up while outperforming SPX. So that's really what we're waiting for, for before going long miners. We want to see that that flip to happen. You make a good point, if I may interject. The gold is actually down 6 to 7% year to date. Uh, that's way outperformed every index. <laughs> it's way much better than the, than the NASDAQ and the S&P and bonds and so forth. So every other major asset class, gold's actually outperformed. Um, well, not every major asset cost against those uh, two indices and, uh, and bonds. So we should we should also just reflect on that. Yeah, I mean, gold gold really is a, a barometer of purchasing power. Over time, gold is just effectively measuring your loss of purchasing power. So you know, it's it's um, it's there to to provide a a backdrop to, um, to to all of that really. So there are periods when different asset classes will over outperform or underperform gold but it's very very important to 
to focus on the S&P and the Nasdaq and the Dow Jones, because that's where the vast majority of investment capital is stored up. It's where it's holed up at the moment. So when you get a bit of a, a shift away from there and into, let's face it, you know, relatively small uh, marketplace that is gold, silver, platinum, palladium, uranium, those kind of things, it only takes a small shift to give a very big result and a big a big push to those prices. So this is only the fourth time that it's happened, as I say, since World War One. And this breakdown versus inflation has now been confirmed on both the Nasdaq and the S&P and uh, also the Dow Jones. So it, all we're waiting for now is the breakdown in nominal terms. And there's a couple of very important support lines that uh, SPX and uh, Nasdaq are uh, moving towards now. And there'll be a very big test at that point. And, um, you know, that, that will be a, a big tell as to where we're going over the next 10 years, because when this happened on the last three occasions, it actually took anything from around about 10 years to over 20 years for the SPX to recover its gains versus inflation. So in other words, if you'd invested at the start of the rotation process, you'd have had to wait over 20 years on a couple of occasions to get back to where you started versus inflation. So as, as an investor, as a trader investor, it's very, very important to spot these very big, um, huge turns that take place and put yourself on the right side of the trade. And uh, as Patrick said, you know, and, and as you said yourself, you know, the, the, the miners give very strong leverage to the price of gold and silver, uh, particularly towards the end of the bull runs in the in sort of uh, the last year or two of the bull runs, then um, some of these miners will, you know, of course, outperform by by multiples um, as the as the retail trade, uh, retail crowd um, pile in. But at the moment, it's just very savvy investors and uh, starting to see some of those funds, perhaps from hedge funds, starting to edge in towards gold with all the risk that's uh, present at the moment. Are we waiting for any specific uh, macro event to happen to sign this uh, pivotal point when where everything is going to go in the direction you just said and gold is going to start to um, go up? That's 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 the breakout that Patrick talked about talked about in the gold to SPX ratio. So as soon as that um, crosses a technical breakout level, um, and there's also the gold to silver ratio which needs to break down, the gold to money supply ratio which needs to confirm a breakdown. Uh, there's a couple of other things: the 30-year yield divided by the 10-year yield breaking to the upside. There's a list of probably, I would say, maybe 10 or so critical charts that need to fall into line to signal that this huge bull run that I think most of us realise is coming in precious metals is actually underway. There have been a number of false starts and these key sort of 10 charts that we're keeping a very close eye on will be the ones that give the, the final sort of green light to, to investors that, you know, this is, this is it, it's, you know, it's really happening. That hasn't happened yet, so more patience is required. And as I say, I, I suspect a, a, a very unpleasant capitulation low is um, is what's needed first. Yeah, so it's a bit, it's a quite complex. It's not going to be so easy. Yeah, um, it's never easy with precious metals, no. <laughs> and if I could add a, a contrarian, like so, that's chart defined, like a micro landscape. But what you're going to start hearing me, I can't wait to start hearing about deflation and inflation's over. I want to hear that in the mainstream media. Because we've got to remind people, gold started, it broke out. I keep saying that in June of 2019, it broke out. Nobody was talking about inflation. There was no uh, uh, COVID. There was no Ukraine. War. There was nothing. Gold broke out in June of 2019. Gold knew all this peak inflation. Gold knew ahead of time. And it kept going up. And it actually peaked when uh, we probably hit uh, peak inflation or six months before we hit peak inflation. So what I want to see now is people, I want to see gas prices going down. I want to start people saying it's all under control. And trust me, we'll be looking at the gold chart and gold will probably start bottoming and breaking out ahead of the next news of inflation. So people stop following the news and look at the chart and you'll get the head start, especially gold, because gold, like Kevin says, is the barometer. It's like the center of the universe of the financial universe. Honestly, it's gold. Gold, gold knows. Sorry, it's like, it sounds dramatic, but it's true. <laughs> Okay, and uh, when we when you are saying right that gold price goes up and then the miners they basically out to perform uh, multiples, what multiples we are talking about? Well, uh, <laughs> you can pick a number out of thin air for that because some of the juniors and the explorers will uh, outperform the. So, for example, if gold moves up from um, you know fifteen hundred to three thousand dollars and sees a sees a one hundred percent move up. 
Um, you know, you can see the miners making three, four times moves, 300%, 400%, and some of them will move from, you know, pennies to, to you know, to, from, from a few cents to a few dollars. So, you know, that you pick the right miner, you can make an absolute fortune. So, you know, the, the, you can't put a number on that because some of them move thousands of percent. You know, look at the uranium sector, for example, in the last uranium bull market, some uh, of the uranium miners moved over 10,000%. Um, but clearly, you know, you, that's only if you get in at the very bottom and exit at the very top. But it's quite realistic to expect, you know, gains of between 500 and 1000 percent on a large number of these uh, juniors and explorers, um, if you time it right. OK, I understand it's complicated, but what will set set up the, let's say, um, we have to kind of identify the company they are best place uh, to um, benefit from the gold price uh, rising. So what will be the criteria of selecting, selecting those companies? What they should have um, in, in your view? And then, and then perhaps Mark, you can comment as well on that based on your experience. Yeah, Mark, Mark will be able to give the fundamental answer to that, but the technical answer um, is always the same with every single chart. There's a, there's a staging process that the, uh, company's chart needs to go through to give scientific technical evidence that it's going to perform well. So on, on a technical chart, you need to be above key moving averages. So the 30 week, 200 day moving average is a very good start. Um, there are a lot of technical chart analysts, Stan Weinstein wrote about this in his book, and it's very true being on the right side of 30 week moving average is key. So that's a starting point and actually making a breakout through the declining weekly resistance line goes along with that hand in hand, you'll then come across a horizontal resistance level that has been built up um, through volume, uh, you know, a high, high vol higher volume of trading. And that almost always gives this sort of horizontal resistance level. It's breaking out through that horizontal resistance level and breaking above the base that is formed that then sends the stock onto its, um, you know, onto its bull market trajectory. So it's a, it's a sort of, sort of a two stage process. You break out of that decline initially and then you usually will have a, a period of basing that takes place up, down, up, down, sideways chop that gets everybody frustrated and then eventually breaking out through that horizontal resistance level. So it's exactly the same with every chart, whether it's a chart out of the S&P 500, whether it's a precious metals chart or uranium chart or whatever. It's always that same process. And as a technical chart trader, you can identify that breakout point. And it's a, it's a really a case of reducing risk. You can try and catch a falling knife and try and get in at the bottom, but that's high risk. Or you can wait for the evidence and get in with a lower degree of risk. And that's, of course, how you manage your portfolio, you know, risk and money management process. Have you put a target on gold that you would expect over, over the medium to longer term? Yeah, there's a number of, number of answers to that using a number of different techniques that you might expect. But the short, shorter term target, if you want to term it shorter term, is probably somewhere in the mid 2000s that's the first realistic target somewhere between 2400 maybe 2600 that's the that's the first target beyond the previous all time high that technical analysts are generally um you know sort of eyeing as a, as an initial, initial staging post um so that that's the first point but then higher values beyond sort of $5000 are entirely possible um entirely sort of realistic you have to remember as well that gold has an eight year cycle, well, seven to 8.5 year cycle. And every Correct. seven to eight, Correct. every seven to eight and a half years, you get um, a notable low point. And that's, that's occurred like clockwork since, um, you know, since the US came off the gold standard. So in recent history, of course, you've got 2000, 2008, 2006, well, late 2015, early 2016. So we're, we're approaching a timing window in sort of late 2023, uh, into 2024, where you might expect a significant low point, but there's no way of knowing whether that low point is going to be a fairly mild pullback or whether it's actually going to be something that takes you down below key moving averages. I mean, it's interesting at the moment that we're down below the three year moving average because that tends to happen at these eight year cycle lows. So it's um, it's, a, it's a very interesting point here. And it, I'm kind of torn between two scenarios. And, and one is a pretty quick reversal in the next few weeks up to those two and a half thousand dollar levels and then to come down and test uh, the 2000 level from above in, in, in the eight year cycle low or 
uh, we are actually on the trajectory already to the eight-year cycle low that takes us on a very long and painful journey for the next 18 months or so uh, down to much lower levels before uh, taking off after that eight-year cycle low. So there's a couple of scenarios there. And I think uh, Elliott Wave technicians have a, a couple of different wave counts that sort of align with different scenarios as well. So um, that that sort of staging post, that eight-year cycle low, is going to be quite important um, to, to yeah. just keep an eye on. Um, but yeah, two and a half thousand is is the first um, the, the first sort of ballpark figure that I would suggest. I don't know if Patrick agrees with that or not. What do you think, Pat? Oh, well, I, th I think what's important now because they're we got to remember they're just like adding zeros to to everything, right? Because the money supply is growing. So I did an exercise recently, and I, you measure stuff in ratios. As an investor, you want to know: Am I cheap? Or my expensive, no matter what the price is, because that's an illusion. People, they they could see a big price tag, but if um, if you like, if everything's high, does it really matter that the, the price tag is high? You want to see, you want to compare two assets. And I did an exercise. So if I circle back to what Kevin said, let's say when the SPX broke down versus the producer price index, inflation, when that happens, that ten to twenty years it needs to uh, to recuperate to break even. Usually when it breaks even 10, 20 years later, that's when gold and silver peak. So you could deduct, you could look historically at ratios, a gold to, uh, a gold to uh, Dow Jones ratio or a gold to SPX ratio at the end of a bull market in gold, it could go up to six to one. In a, I think in 2011, it went up to 15 to one. And in the 1980s, it went, it went up all the way to six to one or five to one. So you could deduct, so let's say the SPX right now it's at 4,000, it breaks down, it needs 10 years to just to recuperate. Let's say you're not greedy and you think, okay, I'm going to hit a 10 or 11 to one, uh, not a 10 to one, it would be more a, uh, maybe three, three to one in favor of gold. I'd have to look at the chart again. Then you can anticipate gold to be at 12,000. So let's say the SPX is 4,000, gold will be Peak, peak valuation for gold will be uh, at 12,000. If you think we're going to the 1980s type of outperformance of gold versus the SPX, then I have some crazy targets like 24,000 gold. But don't be impressed, guys, by those numbers. Don't Those numbers mean nothing because it's all a question of how far can gold outperform SPX? And one day, will the pendulum will swing back. How low can gold underperform SPX, right? And that's where we are now. Generation, we're at 1970 lows. We're at uh, 1999 lows in relative performance versus SPX, right? So eventually the market is just gonna swing the, the pendulum on the other side. And when is it gonna swing? It swings when gold breaks out versus SPX It's giving you a signal that we're in a new cycle of the ratio of performing. So if SPX goes to 8,000, then gold will be just a multiple of that at the end of its bull era. And if SPX goes down, let's say there's total deflation and SPX is not able to go down, gold will go up, but not as high as it, it would have. It all depends about the money printing, about if it's like if they keep adding zeros and whatnot. Gold, at the end of the day, will protect your purchasing power. And right now it is cheap in that regard. It's undervalued. Stefan, to answer the question on sort of the classic, how do you analyze gold equity companies? I mean, if people look at them, uh, you know, if, your, if your viewers look at them, they're probably going to look at them in two major ways. They're going to look at uh, a gold producer, let's say, and they're going to look at uh, net present values and then discounts or multiples of net present value, which can be attributed to it. The net present value, you can adjust depending on what gold price you want to plug into your economic model for it. Uh, so it's all very well saying, okay, well, we can use uh, 1,700 gold, but uh, and maybe some a producer might be try, trading, depending where it is in the world, uh, for geopolitical risk, if it's trading in North America, or its production's in North America, uh, it might be trading at uh, two times uh, multiple uh, at current gold prices to at net present value. And if it's in a more risky part of the world, it might be at a slight discount. But should gold move up 30%, the, 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 the net present value uh, just goes exponentially better. So those ratios will go up. There'll be a massive asset allocation into the equity sector. The generalist funds will go in to gold equities who are currently out, I think. Um, uh, and you'll see very big moves happening across the equities. The other way for the explorers is to value it as a what is the cost of an ounce in the ground on them? So, and that's basically taking the independently verified mineral resource estimate or reserves uh, and taking the market cap. So just dividing one by the other. So you take a market capitalization divided by the number of ounces in the ground. Um, so in Condor's case, we're trading at about 1% of the gold price today. Uh, so you either buy an ounce of gold for 1,700 and 
channel around that today, or you can buy one share of Condor at the same, but our gold's in the ground. Uh, next week, in the next 10 days, we'll put out a bankable feasibility study on our project. Um, and that's the final study. We've just spent $10 million in the last 12 months, months on it. Uh, the project's now completely de risk. Um, we're not producing, as you know, Savannah. We, we're, 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 we, we're basically de risked the project. So we've got all the permits to construct the mine, to operate the mine. Uh, we bought all the land. Uh, I met the president of the country a couple of months ago. I met the Minister of Finance in June, and I met the Minister of Labour last last uh, three weeks ago. And I'm flying actually to Nicaragua this weekend. But I, the reason I, I say those metrics is uh, those are the companies which, if if gold you know, goes two and a half thousand, uh, uh, there, there'll be warrants on the gold price in a sense. There'll be there'll be multiples. I think that you'll see returned. Yeah, it's, it's important, as Patrick says, not to be massively impressed with, you know, projections of, say, $5,000 gold. I mean, just, just to set it in context, um, if the period that we're entering now is comparable to the period 1970 to 1979, and bearing in mind what happened in the 1970s was as a result of an oil price shock, which I think emanated from actions taken by the oil producing nations due to they didn't particularly like the way <laughs> our part in the Yom Kippur, Kippur war I think it was at the time but um, that energy price shock uh, and the inflation that followed has um, some sort of unnerving echoes with what's happening at the moment and um, what's happening with interest rates and yields and all that kind of thing so just to, to as I say to set in context if we get a repeat of the 1970 to 79 period here in the UK by the year 2032 so within the next 10 years a pint of beer will rise from four pounds a pint to 13 pounds 68 a pint uh, the average the average home energy bill will rise from uh, a couple of thousand pounds to over seven thousand pounds well <laughs> that's probably probably going to happen by next year if you listen to the uh, what's going on in the in the news at the moment average monthly mortgage payments would rise in the uk from 700 pounds a month to four thousand 300 pounds a month a pair of jeans would rise by 500 percent a car would quadruple in price uh, and oil will rise to over 600 dollars a barrel so um that's just if we repeat what happened in 1970 to 1979 and bear in mind that when you look at things like the german ppi index the german ppi has surpassed anything that happened in the 1970s not only that but it's surpassed um the incredible peaks of uh, post-World War II, which were considerably higher than the 1970s. And here we are in 2022, and German PPI has gone way, way beyond either of those two previous historical highs. So the idea that what we're seeing now will be looked back on by historians as truly historic, and uh, not only comparable to the 1970s, but quite possibly worse than the 1970s, is actually a realistic suggestion so uh, those figures that I just read out, oil at six hundred dollars, um, that you know could turn out by twenty thirty two to be uh, something of an underestimate. So five thousand, ten thousand dollar gold set against that doesn't sound quite so so um, unachievable. So, uh, but be careful what you wish for because the kind of world that we'd be living in by the by the time you've had those many zeros um, might not be very pleasant. I mean, look at I mean in the nineteen seventies we had that issue and we came out of it. And the world continued and life carried on. But um, the elephant in the room, I suppose, is the debt burden that we've built up since the 1970s, you know, 30 trillion plus of debt in the United States. Um, and goodness knows how much unfunded liabilities. So the ability for interest rates to rise as they did in the 1970s just doesn't seem to be um, doesn't seem to be there. Um, so we have we have a key difference between now in the 1970s, we've got a lot of the same dynamics, but uh, a few very, very important parts of the uh, mechanism have changed dramatically, which will have an impact on the outcome and probably make it far more um, chaotic than it was actually in the 1970s. That's my personal view anyway. And, and I think this is where Investi comes in, because uh, at the moment, one of the challenges of everybody is actually preserving your wealth. And if you keep... Uh, um, your assets in cash, then you are going to be exposed to all this kind of volatility. So you want to invest because 
that's kind of a way that you can keep uh, maybe get more upside but perhaps just maintaining um the wealth that you have and uh, and then you need to have a diversified portfolio so you can't just invest in tech stock or in uh, you know pharma or exciting things you also have to kind of edge it with uh, uh, real world assets like like gold and silver and that's why we are having this conversation the other point on that is that you know mm-hmm. the, the other biggest buyer we've had just recently is the central banks uh, the central banks, uh, I was just looking before this call, uh, 218 tons of gold were purchased in July by by central banks. So that's a massive amount of gold that's just off the market. And they're storing that. You know, that's not going anywhere. That's uh, taking gold as a $12 trillion currency. And they're adding their, you know, they're allocating their foreign exchange reserves and putting 10, 20% into gold. And and if you look at the weaponization of the US dollar, if you're, if you're sitting there, any any country that disagrees with America, uh, from it could be anywhere in the Middle East, the Far East, China, parts of Africa, and suddenly see U.S. dollar assets frozen, and any billionaire like Abramovich suddenly in Jersey he had five billion dollars frozen there. Are, are, are you, where are you going to hold your money? Um, so so gold gold does have an appeal right across as a diversification of wealth preservation and a hedge against inflation. We talk about the hedge against inflation. If you're sitting in Argentina now, inflation is running at 70%. Well, if you were smart a year ago when you put some money into 10, 20% of your money into gold, you'd now be probably probably uh, able to go back in and buy a property. And you've got 70% more probably to pay with a purchasing power. So it is a it is a global instrument to, to, to emphasize. And, and I think part of that buying, we saw big much, bought big, much more buying from domestic China and from India. Where the local prices were a little bit weaker, because because the headwind for us has been a very very strong dollar at these highs, um, but it does make gold cheaper in other currencies uh, uh, eventually, and a little, they're therefore attracting more, more more buyers to come in. I just point out that you know, it is very global gold. It's all so we we focus a bit with the technical side on the S and P ratios and so forth, but there's genuine demand out there, and that gets tucked away for a very long time. I'm I'm going to start to ask some questions that we are getting from our viewers and, uh, you know, you can see who wants to take it. Um, someone is asking, if I only have a small uh, um, amount of money to invest uh, and I would like to invest in gold, how should I get exposure directly through gold or through gold mines? What will be the best gold with small funds? Got a number of options, haven't you? I mean, you can either go to your local gold bullion dealer and walk in and uh, and buy gold and silver over the counter, or you can buy it online, of course, through reputable reputable uh, companies and organisations, or you can uh, get a share trading account and uh, start, you know, building up a portfolio of uh, of mining companies, mixture of major uh, producers and uh, uh, you know a smaller number of explorers and uh, junior companies um you know you don't have to limit it to gold and silver of course you can um buy mining companies across the commodity space so my, my personal preference is to have a you know a broad spectrum a broad mix of of um different options different ways of exposing and also companies i probably shouldn't name them but there are companies you can google where you can get um the storage of your gold and silver done actually um uh, it, through um, bullion banks and at very very low cost with very very low uh, fees for taking physical possession if you want to do that so there's an increasing number of companies now out there that will allow you to do that and uh, some in particular that are that are focusing on um, giving exposure to things like cryptocurrencies gold and silver and being able to rapidly exchange from one to the other so that's worth exploring as well but um so, you know, there's a number of different options and you need to do your own sort of research, depending on which part of the world that you live in, what options that you have, what your, um, you know, which are the best sort of trade trading platforms to use. Um, here in the UK, Hargreaves, Lansdowne and Interactive Investor are very good, give you full exposure exposure to, um, to the mining companies. Um, but uh, physical is also something that's probably I would recommend everyone has a, an allocation to. Whatever money you decide to put into gold, I'd just go and split it three ways. I'd take some physical. <laughs> I would look at uh, uh, a fund. Uh, an e- uh, if you if you want an ETF, there are plenty of gold ETFs. There are also 
funds that track the junior indices, the Huey Goldbergs index in the states, uh, and, the, and the major Goldberg, uh, major gold miners index in the states. And then, you, the, depending on when you go down the risk curve, you can look at the, the, the bigger producers producing a million ounces of gold plus per annum, so they've got the cash flow and and so forth. And then there's the juniors. So, but I would I would look at your own risk appetite as an, any investor yeah. should do, and then split it across that spectrum depending on what type of risk you want to take, regardless of how much you've got to invest. I would. Uh, that's a question that an investor has got to ask, answer for themselves. The other question is, um, what will be basically the bottom that we could envisage for gold if somebody wants maybe to wait to see if they can buy gold at a better price? It's, it's, it's simple, guys. Don't try to catch a falling knife. And until... The, the craziness of the market sell off. We don't know how deep it's starting to roll over now. It's dragging everything down with it. I'm telling you, wait for look at our tweets because uh, we have a website, but we the, these big picture charts we post them. I'll be screaming out loud when gold breaks out versus uh, SPX on a monthly chart. Come in and check out my my tweet feed because I'll be screaming. That's when I'm going to go crazy. Uh, uh, for me, I'll know that the headwinds are now tailwinds and something important has happened as defined by that chart. So even there'll be pullbacks, but I'll know I'll be buying very close to a low because there's also opportunity costs. You could you could be try to pick it at the bottom a low and cost average in, but it, it could take, let's say it takes two years. Are, are you, do you have the emotional capacities to, to endure? People can't even endure a week of, uh, of uh, gold going down and they go nuts because they're over leveraged. So the, the best is to wait. Don't catch a bottom. Wait for the trend to actually change. Yes, you might be 20, 20% higher, but at least the opportunity cost will be diminished because now you'll have eight days up, two days down instead of two days down, two, two days up and eight days down, you know? It's, and that psychologically, it's much easier to hold as you're in an uptrend, right? So don't try catch a bottom because that's going to be a, a recipe to, uh, to destroy your emotional capital. And if you lose that, then you, you'll, you'll panic sell at the exact bottom <laughs> that, yeah, of course, like everybody, that. everybody wants numbers. Everybody wants to know where is it going to stop? Where is it going to, you know, Patrick's very right. You know, focusing on the number itself is, you know, misleading. You know, you're, you're kind of trying to, you know, put, put a number on something that we just don't, you know, if we're honest about it. And I've said this many, many times, forecasting the future is not about being able to pick a precise number. It's about um, assigning probabilities. So we can we can suggest what is most likely but there's a range of possible outcomes and a range of possible solutions. Um, and they change, of course, as you move through time, as you go to next week and the week after, you know, the, the, the probabilities are continually shifting, like they're doing a horse race or like they're doing a, you know, a weather forecast or whatever, you know, stuff changes as you move through time. So trying to put a precise number on it isn't the right way to approach it. As Patrick says, using the ratio charts and using the breakouts, um, then that that will you know that will answer your question regardless of the number. Just wait, be patient, wait for the ratio breakout, gold to SPX, gold versus money supply. You know all these indicators. Then you get in. Just don't don't sweat about trying. To, is it going to be fifteen hundred or fourteen hundred? You know we don't. If any any technical analyst is is completely honest, they they will say, well you know we we can't be certain because because you can't you just can't. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I'm just going to add another question about the next bull, gold, gold and silver bull run. So how long is going to go for so that investor can kind of see, right, if, if now is a good time to invest in gold, when is not going to be, when is going to be a good time to get out of gold and silver? What your, you know, your study is saying? Well, I'm going to look at uh, Mark's company. And when it's worth a billion dollars, I'm uh, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think they make a really good point uh, earlier um, that, that it's a very long cycling gold, and where you're about, I just re-emphasize what colleagues say: it, it is a very long cycle. Uh, it's not a six-month cycle; it's an eight-year cycle minimum, uh, and you're getting towards the end of an eight-year cycle. If you even just look at the as an average chartist like me, who can see the price came up from the last side, it's done nothing. It's traded at the bottom end of a two and a half year range at the moment at 1700. And it's traded in between. And the, my personal view will be that there's a lot of macro, the, the main money managers who are doing asset allocations into actual be looking at dollar strength, 
real interest rates and policy tightening in the Fed. And they'll, they'll be looking at those things. And they'll look a little bit at the charts, right? So to put it in context of those people who are making the asset allocation decisions, those will be, when those start to roll over and you think, oh, okay, the dollar's peaked and there'll be people having different views and the higher interest, right, real interest rates change around and policy tightening, we're going towards the top of it. I think gold's just going to take off personally. And then we'll break through that previous high of, 2050 to 2500 i agree with that analysis so but they're long cycles so it could go on when this turns expect it to turn for a, you know, a number several years i think yeah the, a lot of the technical analysis i can get my words out a lot of the technical analysis points to the late 2020s or um you know sort of around 2030 so we're looking at a number of years of um, upside for precious metals um, and in fact Patrick's got some analysis that um, actually points to much higher higher values beyond that so um, you know this could could extend in in legs um, sort of beyond beyond a 10-year time frame um, so but certainly that period from 2024 through to the late 2020s 2030 looks highly um, favorable for for precious metals and for commodities generally well, and we can have another conversation about when is a good time to get out. I mean, <laughs> it'd be good to be in uh, in the space now. And uh, yeah, so I would like to thank you all for uh, coming on this uh, on this show and discuss uh, uh, where gold price is going and uh, gold investing opportunity has been great. And uh, I hope that our viewers enjoy as well if they have any question they can always get in touch with me on uh, social media or via email and then we can uh, do it again and answer more questions good stuff sounds good to me yes great thank, thank you thank you. thank you thank you bye everyone and bye i will see you next time